Is it your first time playing D&D and you're having trouble coming up with a character? Or you guys are uh, str- been playing D&D for a while and you're struggling to come up with a character that really fits? Well, in this video, we're going to be going over the steps it takes to make a good character that's fun for you to play, fun for the other characters to experience you play, and to make combat and the game you're playing feel good. This is not just for D&D, this is for making a character for pretty much any dice rolling role play games. Whether it's homebrew or whether it's it's a different system, this is for anyone to just jump into a process. Just a few guidelines to jump ahead so it's easier for you if you don't know what you're doing. Alright. So, step one to create a character You want to make a character that's fun to be. What's going to make you happy in combat? What's going to make you happy while role-playing? What's going to be fun for you to experience? First, you need to pick an archetype. Something that you can build your character off of. Are you going to have a character that's a basic shounen protagonist? Like Goku, Luffy, or Naruto? Someone who wants to be the best, be the strongest push forward, push past for goals? Or are you going to be a little bit more of an Avenger? A character who's been wronged in the past. Maybe his family was murdered. Or um, he was oppressed all his life and now he's raising out from it. And you want to be someone who's showing everyone what they're made of. Or are you a character that's quieter, who sits back and watches the battle unfold? And then you get up and you take your move and you quickly bring your party together. Are you a leader or are you someone who takes orders? Pick an archetype. It can be anything. It can even be a stereotypical D&D class. Like, uh, my character is your average mage. Or my character is an average barbarian. Pick an archetype to build off of. Don't let this be your whole character. Let this be a piece of the puzzle that is your character. Next thing you're going to want to do is pick a character type. So there's two types of characters. There's static characters and dynamic characters. Dynamic characters change throughout the story. They can become better, better people. They can learn more things. They can learn to have respect for their party members. They can learn to value their friends and conrads as they push forward by having them there for them in hard times. They can maybe become more darker, maybe a paladin that gets corrupted by seeing the true horror that is a world. Maybe he sees a lord of a um, small village that has been oppressing his people when he believed that lords are supposed to help their people. What is he doing? Or maybe he sees other paladins uh, who believe in the word of God so strongly that they burn heretics and he starts to pull back his faith. A a static character is someone who is a pillar in their world. Typically, they're more um, idealistic or comedic in their tones. A great example of this from anime is uh, Luffy from One Piece. He is a pillar in his world. He changes very little throughout the entire story. But because other characters know him, he helps them become better people. He pulls them up to his idealistic levels and shows them that he can change. What do these two things mean for your character? Do you want to be someone who stays the same or do you want to be someone who changes? It's a lot easier to play a static character. If you want to push yourself out of your comfort zone, I would suggest trying a dynamic character. Someone who maybe give them a flaw, like a, an inferiority complex or a superiority complex, and work with your DM, uh, with or GM, depending on what game you're playing, uh, to pull your character in different directions. Maybe the GM wants you to become more humble, and he will uh, put you in situations such as duels against people you view as inferior, and show them that they can be just as strong, if not stronger than you, and your character might have a change of heart about those people or about said circumstances. Um, next thing you want to choose is how does your character speak and act? This is all about like how fun it is to be your character. 
don't pick a voice you definitely can't do and you're not going to be able to replicate. Uh, a bit of a hint to doing lighter, deeper voices. You see your Adam's apple right here in your throat. If you bring it down, you can make your voice deeper. If you bring it up, you can make your voice lighter. Uh, but you don't just have to change how deep or how light your voice is. You can also change the inflections you use in tones. You could be a grumpy all the time and uh, maybe stumble on your words a few times and uh, move through a story like that. Or you can be uh, a bit more timid and uh, maybe be uh, nervous about everything. Or you can be very confident and stoic. And every journey is an adventure that we must take with our own two hands so we can truly admire the beauty that is living. Think about how your character would act, what kind of character you're going through, or maybe you're a silent character, someone who spends most of his time in the background, always trying to help the party, but not getting lured into a trick. Or if you really want to, you could do an accent. You could try to be uh, a little bit more UK, uh, speak with an accent, uh, just to basically give some flavor to your character, and speak in any sort of different accent, if you want to have it timid, or you want to be as confident as you can be. Uh, you can uh, be older. Uh, what are you doing, Sonny? What? I can't hear you. Or you can be from anywhere. It depends on what you find fun to be. This is how you're going to be for most of this uh, campaign. If it's a one-shot, you can pretty much pick anything. But if it's a longer, drawn-out campaign, you might want to make sure it's something you can do consistently. If a southern accent is something you can do consistently, that's what you're going to want to do. Pick something you can do, and always try to push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone every time you make a new character. That's how you grow as a human, and that's how you grow as a role player. Um, think about what you want to accomplish in the game, and is this a character who would set out to take these same goals? For example, if you took an, pick an archetype, so I want to be... A uh, standard protagonist. I want to be someone who wants to be the strongest, who wants to be the very best. I want to be the greatest sword fighter, uh, or so forth. I'm going to be uh, a idealistic, static character who is going to push his friends forward to be the best that they can be. My character is going to speak cheery and always pushing forward. Um, he, it wouldn't make a lot of sense if I want this character who wants to be the greatest swordsman to also be um, a warlock with a patron. It just wouldn't fit with who he is unless I make him or I could go back through the list and make him a warlock, such as I want him to still be idealistic, but I want him to be a little bit more reserved. He will become the greatest scholar. And he will show everyone the true beauty that is his magic. And he will push his Conrads forward. Um, so think about what you want to do in game before you make a character. If you want to be make someone who's uh, a warlock, you might want to do something a little bit different. If you want to make someone who you know wants to defeat a dragon, focus your character around that goal. Um, it wouldn't make a lot of sense if you built a... Someone who's in the background, sneaking around, to want to be the greatest dancer. No. You would want to basically align these two goals together, or give a reason why these characters are the same. In step two. Oh, come on. There we go. Step two. Create a background for your character. So, a background is the reason why your character is the way it is. If my character in the first example, wants to be the greatest swordsman. Uh, let's give a reason why the character acts the way he does. So this character is clearly a little bit naive. He doesn't know everything about the world yet. So one reason why he can act this way is he'd be younger. So let's give him the age of 15 in this fantasy world. Uh, that's why he acts the way he does. That's why he's so cheery. He just hasn't seen how dark the world really can be yet. Uh, we want to ground our character in the game's world. 
So this is going to take a lot of working with your DM or GM at learning their world. If this is a campaign that has previous lore and backstory, I suggest talking to another player or your game master about this previous campaign that went on before in the same world. So you can learn maybe there's a crime family, an evil villain, a, a hometown, a capital city, a, a notable old character that you can relate your character to. I always try to do this with every one of my characters in the campaign that I'm doing with my friends called Golden Days, which takes place in basically if D&D started to modernize and magic started to fade away. And now instead of magic, uh, characters are starting to develop uh, different talents, which is kind of like a mix in between like um, magic from Black Clover and quirks from My Hero Academia. So everyone has a specific thing that they can do, and it grows and evolves with them as they become different people, as they grow as characters. So, um, to ground one of my characters into a world, uh, let's pick, I play a character called Captain Jones in one of our uh, campaigns. And Captain Jones is a pirate! He's been asleep for 300 years because of a battle he had with the Monza. The Monzas are a crime family in the world that have existed for a very long time. So, in this world, there are four main continents in the Northern Hemisphere. And he spent most of his time around one of these continents called Primus. The Monzas had an alternative pirate fleet. And basically, there's a metal that basically is like the kryptonite for talents. If you get hit by it, your talent can't affect Ilium. Uh, Ilium is the metal. They can't affect uh, the Ilium with their talent. And if they get hit by uh, the Ilium, it basically cuts them off from their talent. So they can't use their talent. So Captain Jones was going to another continent called Alta, which is like the wild frontier. It's like the dark continent from Hunter x Hunter. Untamed terrain, giant creatures, um, venomous plants, crazy stuff like that. So he wants to go bury his treasure there. And then there was a storm where basically he and the Monzas were both in this storm fighting out, and his talent was basically to control seawater. And his one limit is how much seawater he has the access to. So he thinks he's pretty much invincible in the ocean. He didn't know about Elium at the time. He jumps onto the Monza's boat, Monza shoots him with an Elium bullet, he falls into the water, and this was back when magic was ravenous in Alta. And he just falls into a pocket of uncontrolled magic. And he gets stuck in stasis for 300 years until he wakes up in the modern day. Um, not at his full strength, because it would be kind of broken for a level zero character to just be able to, you know, control the entire ocean to just flood away a city. But he wakes up right in time for the story. And he swims to a city that is in our uh, where the world is nowadays in our campaign. And he learns about the world has changed in 300 years. Now, with this, I gave my character a person to hate, the Monza family, which is a crime family that still exists. And his main character motivation is going to be to get rid of the Monza. That's why he feels grounded in this world. He has history in the world that he's given. He has a strong sense of revenge. If he hears about the Monza, he gets a mighty angry. Captain Jones is a wild man. You never know what he's going to do. Captain Jones also believes that he is the most evil character in the entire uh, world. When he really isn't. He's naive and he does a lot of goofy things. That makes him believe that he is the worst character. So he'll try to cheat. So if he, uh, we got into a duel with the Monza, and Captain Jones was like, This isn't going to be an honorable duel. If he thinks I, a pirate isn't going to cheat, he's got another thing coming. And Captain Jones basically had one of his other um, crew members take a puppet dressed as him to the duel. And he was going to basically attack him without him noticing. But instead, Captain Jones got so excited, he ran into battle, 
Uh, and he's like, Hi, you shouldn't have expected a pirate not to cheat. But he ended up uh, believing he cheated, but still having a perfectly honorable battle. Also, uh, make sure you send your backstory to your DM or your GM, and make sure they approve of this, and maybe they can give you some tips or tricks, because no one will know your Game Master's world better than the Game Master themselves. Let them help you. Let them help you experience the best possible way you can experience this world. All right, finally, think about how this character is going to fit into your game's system. If your character doesn't mesh with what you want to do with it, you're not going to have a fun time because you wrote your character in a certain way, but he won't be able to do all the things you want him to do if you do not work with your DM and the game system. Therefore, what class should your character be? If you write an odd Chinese character who spent his entire f life practicing the fist, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for him to be using a sword the entire time. You should... What the hell? I didn't touch anything. Uh, okay, very weird. Uh, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for him to be a fighter using a sword the entire time. He should be a monk, or if you don't like that, give a reason why he should use a sword. Maybe he started out as a monk practicing pacifism, but... One day, when his entire monastery was killed by a mysterious individual, the individual left his blade behind, and he vowed to get revenge for his fallen comrades. Pacifism wasn't an option anymore. And that could be your character's uh, call to adventure. Every character needs a, a, a reason why he's participating, reason why he's working with the other members in the party. What is your character's moral code? Is he a paladin who's lawful justice, and no matter what evil doing he sees, he will put an end to it quickly? Is that moral code going to be challenged? Is it going to change as the story goes along? Maybe this is a character who had strings of bad luck, and he watched his family died, and he did some rough things for a while for very bad people, but now he's trying to finally make amends because he f he started to feel what he was doing was wrong, that his family wouldn't approve, and now he's trying to make a difference in the world, and he's trying to become a better person, and that internal struggle is going to fight within him. Can your character work with a party? If you're making a lone rogue, who's a solo player, he won't work with anyone. Will that work with what your DM is trying to do? If you make a character who's um, a Han Solo who refuses to work with anyone, no matter what, no matter what, there's no convincing him, would that work in this uh, game system? If it's a one-shot, probably, because you run away, die, campaign's over in uh, six hours, You'll be in the next one. Uh, is your DM someone who likes to split up the party and have them do their own separate things? Or is your DM a little bit newer? Or do they just hate splitting the party and they don't think it makes for good storytelling? Um, work with your party and your DM to see what his DM's, DMing style is like. If it does not jive with the party or the GM, change your character so it's more fun for everyone. If your character is running off and the, the party doesn't like him so they don't chase after him and he's getting to shenanigans on his own, you have five other players who's sitting on the sidelines not being able to do anything. Make sure your character can incorporate other members of the party into his uh, world. Or if your GM can incorporate naturally your character into theirs. For example, Going back to Captain Jones, he has a ship with a great large crew, and sometimes when the party needs to go from one place to the other, Captain Jones just happens to be there, and he'll give them a pickup and a ride, because he loves to hear the stories of people he passes by. Captain Jones views all people as just people, 
There's no good and there's no bad. Everyone's just a person with a story to tell. And Captain Jones loves to hear about stories almost as much as he loves finding a new adventure to grab him. So, Captain Jones would try to first recruit every character onto a ship, which doesn't typically happen. But there's one party member who is the first mate on Captain Jones' fleet, and Captain Jones does enjoy uh, helping out people not in need, but if it seems to lead to an adventure that's profitable. If it's something that can lead to a, a sense of happiness for the crew, uh, or if it's something that can bring treasure and victory and vengeance on the Manza, he will pretty much be a down to do anything the characters want. Uh, I have, we'll talk about some more examples uh, afterwards. Um, so make sure your character can work with the party. Again, depends on the DMing style. Make sure it works with the DM, which is why it's very important to collaborate with your DM or GM on how your character shapes out in this world. Does your character make sense in this world? I'm going to point out Isekai. Isekai is when a character gets transported from our world into a fantasy world and this works in many cases but is this what your uh, dm wants would this not make any sense in his story because he's already has plans for another character to come from another world for a very specific reason and this would mess with the plot continuity uh which is why it's very important to work with your dm is this world a Roman Colosseum where every fighter must fight and you guys must get out and you guys are all locals? It wouldn't make a lot of sense for you to be a dark elf in an entire country full of humans unless you have a narrative reason for it if all your characters are born into this spot. Sure, maybe you're an outcast, but it'd be very weird if you're one out of everything else that doesn't fit. It doesn't feel realistic in this world. Make your characters blend in. Make them feel alive in this world. Make, uh, Give them NPC characters in their backstories to fit into this world. Always write... I uh, skipped over it a little bit in Cap 2. Uh, uh, in Step 2. But always write down a backstory. Whether it's one paragraph or nine pages. Anything is better than nothing. It makes it so you can always go back, reread a first couple sentences, and go, oh, this is what my character would do. Or go back to it and appreciate what your character has gone through since his start in the beginning. And this is about it. For now, I will give a few examples, also coming from our Golden Days campaign with a couple of other characters I've played. So another character I played... Uh, her name was Tanya, and she is a uh, very short middle school girl. And she is stubborn, and she basically spent the entire of the beginning of the campaign just trying to fit in with the party. So let's go back to step one. And the archetype that I picked for her was I basically based her appearance off uh, Tanya from Saga of the Evil, because I think she's cute, and I thought she'd be fun to play. Um, for her archetype, I wanted her to be someone who was basically repressed all her life because of her family's economic situation, being very poor, and finally getting her chance to push past and prove herself to everyone in her community. Uh, I wanted to make her a very dynamic character, someone who would get a lot of room to grow and become a better person as they move up uh, in the campaign. Uh, I wanted her to speak in a voice like this. Or I could make it higher. Or I can make her speak like this, and then I can have her talk like this, blah, 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 blah. Um... I wanted her to basically have a very weak talent. Uh, I wanted her... I, I thought it would be funny to have her just have a Glock and just go around shooting all the enemies. And her talent was a talent called Invisible Backpack. And basically it was just a small pocket dimension that she could basically store things in. But it was very bad because unlike um, a bag of holding, she could still feel the weight of everything in there. And she's a short, tiny person with a low strength stat. 
So if you took this plate, which is about I don't know a couple pounds, and she you, she put it into her portal, she could feel those couple of pounds, which means there's a finite limit to what she can hold, and she can only hold things that are not alive. Nothing alive can go into it. And yeah, uh, da da da. Uh, I wanted her to accomplish proving herself out to the people in her community. So she came from a small town called Wallen, and she went to a school basically that her parents worked really hard to get her into, so they can she could have a better life than them, and so that um, she could get into the school, which like a bunch of heroes have come from, and a bunch of people who are really good with their talents, whether they work for like Hero, which is a hero organization. Very similar to a hero, like, um, what's a good example? Like the hero organization in One Punch Man, where it's one central figure monetizing all these heroes. Um, why does my character act the way she does? Tanya acts the way she does because her entire life, uh, anyone she considered a friend had betrayed her. Uh, so she's very slow to trust other characters, even if they are players, and she hates using the word friend. Uh, the word friend to her was just a word that people used on other people as a spell to trick them into doing something for them and then backstabbing them. My character was grounded into the game's world because uh, I used... Her Wallen is set in a very oppressive country in the world, and it's basically one of the only countries where it has outs. Uh, it's the only town in this country that has outside access to the other places, because they want people with talents to bring them in for this school, because then they can recruit soldiers from these top class of people. Um. Of course, I wrote down this backstory. It ended up being the longest backstory I ever wrote. Uh, it's 11 pages. And I'm writing a book on this campaign right now. A light novel. And it is the first chapter of it. And it is the first 11 pages. Okay. Step three. What classes could my character be? Well, we're not really looking at classes. We're looking at... Uh, just because talents are such a flexible system and we're not using class system because this is an entirely homebrewed campaign. So, let's think about if Tanya was in a 5e style. What classes could she be if she's using uh, a gun and I want her to basically rise to power? I see in my head two options. She could be a ranger or a fighter. Both options are good because they both use what she already has and it allows her to basically use her own strength and own power to push forward uh, and to rise to the occasion. Uh, my character is grounded in the in-game world because the world is typically set in like an early 1920s um, world where there is some technology and magic starting to fade off, but it's not like there's full-blown cities and electricity everywhere. And not really any, like, laptops or computers or whatever. And then finally, write it down, write down the story, send it to your DM. When I sent my story to the DM in the first, I think, mm, three weeks of playing, so six sessions in, uh, he asked me, uh, where is your character from? And I was like, I don't know. Is she from this place? And he said yes, and I incorporated that into my ba uh, story's background. And he gave me some um, explanation on like what kind of place this is, and I fit my town into this place as kind of a, a port of entry. Um, yeah. So we will give... How long is this? 30 minutes? Uh... We'll do one last um, example. So we'll go back to Captain Jones. I wanted to play a pirate who wanted a crew to share his adventures with. And so he could storm off 
and hove a battle with nothing but his own two swords and his talent, which is powerful as the sea is wide. So, my archetype was a pirate captain with few moral values. He was going to be a static character, someone who would bring his crew up and to pull off our characters into being more than they were. Uh, he speaks and acts like a pirate. Uh, think about what you want to accomplish in the game, and is this a character who would set out to say, take these goals? So I didn't really think about this before I made the character. I just knew that in his background, I wanted to make him uh, uh, go against Vamanza, which was a crime family a very powerful one that would take a long time to achieve that goal. And even after he uh, achieves that goal, he wants to go on great adventures. So he would continue on living. His uh, reason to live wouldn't disappear with his accomplishment of his goals. If you make a character that's solely for revenge or achieving one specific motive and they spent years and years trying to get it, after they get it, they feel empty. They either have to look for something new to find or die. So you want to make sure that your character is enough to go after or live for the sake of his party afterwards. Next, why does your character act the way he does? Well, my character, uh, his wife and ship was sunk in that final battle. He was pushed into the ocean and then he lost 300 years. He acts the way he does because he viewed his crew as his family. Very similar to the fairy tale uh, guild or the crew in One Piece. They killed my family, and for that, they will pay. The dirty monster bloodline ends in this generation if my sword has anything to say about it. Well, I'm getting over from having a sore throat, so I can't do my voice as good as I'd like to. Um, my character is ground into the game's world because um, in the age of crime families, he was very prominent before stasis for 300 years, and he has history with an upper crime family on the planet. Um, and then, of course, I wrote down a couple pages of backstory, and I sent it to my DM. Just the important part. So I wrote first uh, the events leading up to him getting the stasis and coming back to the area that he did in campaign. And then later I went back and I wrote some of his early life. So I wanted him to have a, a reason why he viewed these people's family. And I said his uh, I, I named him Captain Jones uh, Flounder Jones, and I, I just gave him the name of a random fish. And then I, I gave a reason for that later in his early story. So I talked about how he was um, the child of a notorious pirate, and he spent all his life on the gr uh, boat, and he had uh, an ability that most people didn't know was a talent at a time, because talents were typically weaker. And even his talent like as strong as it is, it has a highly specific activation requirement. It has to be seawater, which means if he was anywhere else on the planet, it wouldn't be a good talent because he wouldn't even be able to control fresh water. And not every place on this uh, world has uh, salt water in the ocean. Well, seawater in the ocean. So, Captain Jones was the child of this very prominent pirate. And uh, this pirate uh, was basically didn't really have a good family dynamic. His dad basically just kept women as pets. And he was the outcome of one of these uh, one night stands, you could say. And his mother died of sickness and his father didn't really care. And he basically lived on the ship as a uh, mopping and pretty much that and the he, his father basically despised him and he every time he saw him and he just caught him speaking and then he learned of his talent that makes him made him angrier almost jealous of his son uh the only people who treated him with any monicum of respect was the crew uh, and the crew feared the captain of the ship as well 
because he was ruthless. He was a man who possessed insane sword skills. He would duel mages on the beach, on beaches, and single-handedly, with one hand behind his back, use his sword to cut down the mages while they were using magic. So he was a man to be feared, and he did this simply to put fear in his own men's hearts. And then one day, uh, enough was enough, and the captain finally decided to kill his son. He's had enough of him. And Jones basically barely managed to get a victory by using his talent to basically control the, the seawater where they were having their duel to pull out uh, his legs uh, out from under his father. His father fell, and Jones got the final blow with a knife. And that's how the battle ended, and the crew decided to sail with Jones as the new pirate, and they spent years and years and years together, about 40 and then he lost his crew, which is why he feels so strongly about this revenge that he wants to take back. Uh, and eventually he got married and his wife became his first mate and she died as well. And the reason, another thing that grounded this into the world was in our first campaign, we had a ship we traveled around on. And this tri ship was a cursed vessel. Cursed objects in the campaign are objects that have... Uh, the users regret when they died infused into that object, and it manifests as a personality this objects have. They can be incredibly powerful, but also incredibly dangerous for the user to use. This boat had was called the Queen of Monsters, and it had a woman who basically said, Ah yes, I I've been on this ship for 300 years, and I've had multiple captains throughout that time, but I'm still looking for... Um, uh, uh, I, I still want to sail the sea. Something still compels me. I was like, what if I make a character that was this woman's original husband when she was still alive? What if this was his pirate ship? So that's why I created Captain Jones, someone who is a foil for, for this character, that for this NPC that already exists. Uh, uh, plot for my, the DM to mold in a way for him to make a better story. That's why grounding a uh, character into a game's world is so important. And yeah, I feel like those two examples illustrate the, these uh, methods pretty good. If you have any questions, leave it in the comments. I'll be happy to respond to anyone. Um, if, you, if you like this, leave a like. If you still have more questions, again, leave a comment. If you want to see more content like this, uh, subscribe to the channel. I typically don't do a lot of D&D &D content. But uh, maybe that'll ch uh, change depending on how much feedback this video gets. Uh, thank you for watching. And I've been Bottle Cap. Have a good night.